Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is geometric topology. I'm about to wrap up geometric topology and today I would like to talk about an application of geometric topology or applications of geometric topology. Um, this time in biochemistry and next time I will talk about cybersecurity. And one of my favorite topics here, uh, I don't know very much about it. I like it a lot. I don't know very much about it. That applies to essentially everything in life, I guess. So that sentence. But um, today we'll only focus on knots and DNA, where, as I said, I like it a lot, but I don't know very much about it. But we'll see how it goes. So there's a deep connection between knots and DNA, which was discovered in the 70s, 60s of the last century, and since then has flourished quite a lot. And I hope eventually, at least I present some ideas which are probably very silly, but anyway, um, that it, it run, it's right way, it's a one-way street. So from not theory, you can get applications in DNA, but usually it should be a two-way street. So there should be some biology applications uh, to not theory, and there are some things I can try to sketch for you. But right now, the point of this video is whatever we have seen in this series, uh, which I hope you enjoyed so far. I, I For me, it was a blast. It was absolutely great. I love it. Um, which you might have noticed. But anyway, uh, so what we have seen so far is actually ridiculously applicable, which is very rare in pure mathematics, uh, that pure mathematics is actually applicable to the real world, um, although being very new. So usually everything in mathematics will be essentially be applicable at one point, but it takes kind of centuries. But here, not theory was essentially immediately applicable, which is so beautiful, so beautiful. Um, higher dimensional, Low dimensional topology, higher dimensional, low dimensional topology. It actually makes sense if you think about it. Anyway, higher dimensional, low dimensional topology, dimension three, four, five, or something. Um, they're usually only used in more abstract physics, like what is the shape of the universe or something like that. But here, uh, in a real life science, is abstract physics a real life science? Let me not count it as a real life science, but let me count biochemistry as a real life science. Um, I'm probably stretching my luck here a little bit too much, and I should just go to knots and DNA. But anyway, here's an application to real life science. I just briefly recall what the knot is. I'm pretty sure if you have made it this far into the video series, uh, you know what a knot is. Um, anyway, um, here is a knot. It's either a mathematical knot on the right hand side, and or that's the whole point. It's on the left hand side, or that's the whole point. On the right hand side, that's actually a picture from a science paper, and it's a knotted protein. Not quite a knotted DNA, but it's a knotted protein. So knots play a huge role in, um, in everyday science. Everyday science? Well, maybe protein science and DNA is not quite everyday science, but in the life sciences. Um, and what we really do, and people really do, is what, what we have learned here. They like not invariants, for example, not polynomials or whatever. And they just like to compute them. They like to know information about knots, dot tables, and so on. Essentially, in this picture here, for example, you have a protein, uh, what type of knot is it forming? You want a knot table, you want to know the genus or something like that. And that's what we really do. And now I will tell you a little bit about how this works in the special case of DNA. So um, here we go. So my interpretation of what's going on. So DNA is this very, very complicated type molecule, um, which we mostly ignore how it really looks like for the purpose of this video. But essentially, well, this is kind of a bad picture. So this picture reads it this way, this picture reads in this direction. But essentially, already the helix itself forms a braid. Uh, so there's some braiding of the ACTG uh, building blocks of the molecule. And then you go braid it, braid it, braid it. So there's already some braid. But the knots come into the game as follows. And when I learned that, I was, re I was really shocked. So um, I link. Uh, my, one of my favorite books is linked in the description. It has a, a whole chapter on knots and DNA. Uh, really, really lovely. So Adam's The Knot Book. Um, anyway, so here's how the story goes. So um, obviously, I'm a failure of nature. So if I have a very important computer cable, for example, that I only need from time to time, I will eventually, let's say, put it in the box. But because I'm a failure of nature, as I said, and I'm very lazy, I just just put it in a box, like, like very stupidly in the box. It's a very important table, but at the moment I don't care. I just smash it in the box, essentially. And let's say a week later I need it and I pull it out again. I open the box and I'm to totally surprised that my little cable is completely knotted. What a surprise. 
ridiculously, right? A shock, shock. <laughs> so my cable is totally knotted. I just squeeze it in the box. I pull it out again. It's knotted. And I should have been just more careful, but I'm a failure of nature. And I always thought like everyone is so much better than me. And then I learned this story from the poly so from, from real life, from DNA. So what is life doing? You would think life has some some million years of time to, to, to do it in a better way. But what is life doing? It has a very important cable. It puts it in a box, needs to pull it out at one point. It is really confused that everything is tangled. So the, the cable here is DNA. Uh, DNA, in, let's say in this video, it forms a, a cycle. And the box is kind of the nucleus of the cell. And since the box is very tiny, it just sticks it in. Like I would stack it in, like maybe everyone would stack in the very important cable. And eventually you need it, for example, if you want to reproduce the DNA or whatever. So you need to pull it out of your little box. And woo, we get very surprised because uh, the DNA turns out to be knotted. So that's how the knots and the DNA uh, come together. Again, in my real life experiment, it's exactly what I would do. I, I do all the time. As I said, and I felt like it's just because I'm such a failure and I could do much better, but life apparently is doing the same. Anyway, so what do I need to do with my cable? Well, I need to untangle it. So I sit there down and just need whatever, 20 minutes to untangle it. So life uh, then also needs some way to untangle the cable. And there are specific enzymes that manipulate um, kind of the, the knot by doing those operations here. Uh, like the first one is very brutal. Oh, here's a very brutal operation. So it's kind of a very strange story, right? So kind of, I'm too lazy to organize my cable in a good way. So I just stack it in the box. I pull it out and I realize it's tangled. So I need to untangle it. And life does exactly the same. Anyway, this is how DNA and knots come together. So knots and DNA. So DNA forms knots. As soon as it's pulled out um, of... Of, of its box, which is just a nucleus of the cell. And then you need to topologically manipulate it. And some crucial questions will be important, like um, how many crossing changes? So here's a real life picture of a knotted uh, DNA. So how many crossing changes do you need to do until it's trivial so you can actually use it for reproduction and all that fun stuff? It just immediately becomes important uh, to, the, to the theory of biochemistry. Why? Well, because uh, I'm so lazy and nature apparently is lazy as well. So the crucial questions like what knots appear, what do we can know about the knots, what is the unknotting number of the knot? The unknotting number is uh, the number of changes of this form you need to do. Uh, um, this was really bad. The number of changes of this form you need to do. So just change the crossings until it gets trivial. So here's a non-trivial knot. You change the crossing in the middle from going over to going under. And now it's a trivial knot. So the unknotting number, for example, will be one. And all of these questions then are really crucial for the study of DNA, because just DNA sits in its box, you pull it out, it's tangled because someone else, someone just messed it up. So usually, usually if you look at life, it's a little bit like uh, whoever designed this must have been very drunk. It, it's random noise. So it's just sort of a random noise. And you would guess. Um, life would have been smarter than I am. Probably it still is, but in this case, we're kind of doing exactly the same mistake. And then it's really brilliant. So biochemists, they use all the invariants we know to kind of say as much as they can about the knot because they end up with the same problem. They end up with a shadow of the knot and they want to know what knot it is, right? They end up with the shadow picture and they want to know what knot it is. Exactly the problems we have seen in knot theory. And then they play around, so we'll come back to those two pictures, which have a very, very bad resolution. But I stole them from a, well, very nice, actually, a paper in biochemistry. So we come back to those on the next slide. And you kind of try to detect knottedness using those. So Jones polynomial is a very famous invariant people use, Havana homology, knot tables, and all of that fun stuff. It's really, really great. So it, it kind of makes sense, right? So because DNA is intrinsically knotted, no, not intrinsically knotted, it's knotted because it was squeezed into the nucleus and you kind of need to unknot it for reproduction, essentially. And reproduction is the whole point of life, I guess. So that's what that's what's going on. So biochemists use that since the 70s, 80s. And I think mathematicians should actually learn something from studying of knots as well. So something, for example, which is really simple to determine um, on the biological knots and really hard to determine on the mathematical knots is the crossing number. So the minimal number of crossings that you need 
uh, in order to, well, to, to, to kind of get your not picture. So trefoil, for example, has three, but you can draw the trefoil with many, many more crossings. And this is really not easy to decide. It's crossing number is one of the uh, slightly officially complicated invariants are not theory, right? but it's simple in that in terms of DNA, I just learned it recently. It's extremely simple. They just put it in jail and then kind of the distance it forms tells you exactly what the, so there's the, the obvious relation here, the kind of linear relation in this picture um, between the number of crossings that you see here with four, three crossings, four crossings, five crossings, six crossings, and so on. And um, it's kind of the distance it forms in the jail. So there should be some way, actually, if you kind of translate that somehow into mathematics to kind of get a better grip on the crossing number. So that's what I meant. It should be somehow a two-way street. And I just learned recently that the crossing number is not a big deal for chemists, while it's really, really complicated for mathematicians. So there should be some way uh, to go there. And there are probably many, many other examples. But now to wrap up, let me just zoom into these pictures. So what you then can do is, uh, the resolution is still not great. So let me just read it or explain it. So here is a biological experiment. And this is the, the one the computer did, the random type experiment. And the point is you just randomly create a non-trivial knot um, with up to five crossings. And this is what it turns out to be. So something like, let's say, this is 49 point something, so 95% of all knots you randomly, non-trivial knots you randomly create with a computer are trefoil knots, 95%. In the experimental one, in the real world data, only something like, I can't read it, but it's 57 or something percent are trefoils, and then the 5-1 knot likes to appear very often as well. So there is some bias here. So you can use kind of, comparison of knot theory and real experiments to see some bias in the knotting of DNA. In other words, um, so this is just my experiment, my cable experiment. I took, pay, take my cable and I place it in the box and I get a random knot. Uh, so essentially always a trefoil if you want. And DNA apparently doesn't quite do the same. So shock again, <laughs> what I told you in the past 20, whatever, 10 minutes or so, was well, actually wrong. So there's some bias. I, I don't understand what kind of bias, and I don't think anyone really does, uh, but there's some bias in the system, and DNA is not completely randomly knotted. They are just, uh, the three one and five one are just way more popular than other knots, and similarly for, for bigger knots. And this is how you can somehow study, uh, use knot theory in a more sophisticated way to study uh, DNA, because there's now some bias. So now you want to try to understand that bias. Maybe there's something going on. Maybe it's related to whatever. And you can try to figure out how different DNA knottings com compared to viruses trying to attack the DNA or something like that. It's pretty cool. So um, DNA knots are not random. They're not random. They're in a different form of random. They're kind of still kind of random. But for example, those are not very popular. So this is 4-1 and this is 5-2. They're not very popular, and 3-1, the trefoil, and 5-1 are just way more popular. Anyway, so the, the picture, which is not quite correct, but I will still repeat it. Remember, it's not quite correct because of the random bias I showed you in the, in the last slide. But essentially, DNA um, is squeezed into the nucleus because life is too lazy, and it puts it out, wants to reproduce it, needs to untangle it, and this is where not theory and biochemistry somehow go hand in hand. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this application of knot theory or this kind of sketch of application of knot theory to biochemistry or in biochemistry, not quite sure. But anyway, I hope you also enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.